Planning for your next trip? Elevate your travel style with Quince. Quince has all the jet-setting essentials you'll want for your next getaway, like European linen, premium luggage options, buttery soft Italian leather bags, and so much more. And it's all priced at 50% to 80% less than similar brands. Plus, Quince only works with factories that use safe and ethical manufacturing practices. Pack your bags with high-quality essentials you'll be wearing for vacations to come with Quince. Go to quince.com slash pack for free shipping and 365-day returns. Welcome to mini episode 338 of Real Life Ghost Stories and I have five spooky stories for you today and the last story comes from January the 30th 2024 and story number one comes from Russell. I've been watching your calls from the dead videos and I had something that happened to me after the loss of my father in 2002. I've had lots of paranormal experiences throughout my life including this. My poor dad had been diagnosed with lung cancer in 2001 He smoked, but very little, and yet there was no evidence of tar buildup in his lungs. I drove him every week for his chemo sessions at the Christie Hospital near Manchester. Unfortunately, he passed away less than nine months later in 2002. We were devastated, as you can imagine. I had actually worked with my dad for many years too, so we were very close. He was my best friend, and I saw him or spoke to him every day so you can imagine how I felt not being able to see or speak to him anymore. He requested to be buried, and I visited his grave every single day from then on, even Christmas Day. I was struggling to let go, but I didn't know that at the time. I worked shifts, and my usual thing was when I was on a 6am to 2pm shift, was that I'd get home, make a cup of tea and doze off sitting on the couch. I would sometimes get woken by a phone call and have half a cold cuppa. That day was no exception. The sound of the phone ringing woke me and I jumped up and answered it. The line crackled and then I heard my dad. Hiya son, I'm just letting you know I'm alright. And before I could answer or say anything the line crackled again and cut off. I was completely baffled as to what had just happened so I sat back down and I remember drinking the rest of my tea while trying to work things out, plus still being groggy from waking up suddenly. I must have fallen back asleep as I woke up again with a bit of a jump. I couldn't get my head around what had happened. I was thinking I must have dreamt it, but I picked my cup up and it was actually empty. Had my dad rang me to let me know that it was okay to let go, because after that I stopped going every day. I did a series of videos on TikTok that were all about phone calls from beyond the grave and the response to them was pretty amazing. So many people in the comments were saying how they had experienced something similar and clearly this has been the same for Russell. So thank you for sending in your story and I'm really sorry obviously that you lost your dad but I do find these stories of phone calls from beyond the grave really compelling. I mean we literally use our phones all day, every day. We have used phones to communicate with people since the late 1800s, I think. So why not when people pass away? Why why wouldn't they use phones to communicate with the people that they love? And to be honest, I know that you said, Russell, you know, maybe it was just a dream. I don't think that really matters. Like if it was a dream, if it was real, if it was in your imagination, I like as long as it brought you comfort. And like you said, it made you feel more more okay with letting go and I think that's that's what matters with this story more so than anything else. And story number two comes from Anonymous. When I was 13 years old I was going to the grocery store with my mom. This was a treat for us because we lived way out in the country and the only thing in our small town was getting to go to the store. I was walking from the car to the store and sort of trailing behind my mother and this woman dressed in odd clothing, or what I perceived was odd clothing at the time. She was wearing a camel coat, a beige turtleneck sweater and brown slacks in August in Florida, and she approached me. 
My mom had passed the woman as she approached me and had jerked her head around like she was shocked to recognise her. For clarity, I resemble my deceased great aunt Mary as if I'm her doppelganger. The woman lightly grabbed my arm and looked at me in the face and said, Whatever you do, don't get married. She looked very earnest and somewhat sad. Then she walked away. I caught up with my mom and we watched her walk across the parking lot to the traffic light. She was standing at the traffic light while we discussed what she had told me and she disappeared into thin air. Now this traffic light is a four lane highway with nothing around it at the time and there was no way that she could have gone somewhere that we couldn't see her. She simply vanished. My mom was rattled because she said the woman looked just like my aunt who was deceased. When I got older and grew my hair out grey, my mother remarked that I looked just like that woman who disappeared in the parking lot. So either my great aunt was an angel that came back and warned me not to get married, or I travelled in time to warn myself. FYI, I have never married, but not for a lack of trying. I often wonder if that incident has subconsciously influenced my decision making. I do have a long history of phenomenally poor judgement about men, so it's probably a good thing that I'm an old maid. It's always a good thing to be an old maid, alright? 100%. This is not the first time that we've had a story like this. So there was, there's been a couple of stories. There was a guy who, like, saw, when he was a child, saw a grown man in his kitchen. And then when he was a grown man, he turned around and saw a kid and realised that he had somehow seen himself. There was another one of those that was a pretty famous Reddit one, I think, where a guy was, like, out... I don't know, out in the countryside and cycled past an older man and then realised it was himself later. I mean, these things do happen. Whether or not it's your aunt or whether it was you coming back in time, whatever you do, don't get married. Seems like pretty, seems like good advice, you know. Maybe in a different timeline, you had a terrible marriage, you know, maybe in a different timeline, you married one of those questionable men and it didn't end very well. A very similar thing happened to my friend. I must ask him, does he still remember this? But it happened a good few years ago. And I definitely have told this on the podcast before where he was on a train and he sat down and the guy sitting opposite him, he realized looked like a, a much older version of him and it really freaked him out. And then the guy was reading a newspaper, like lowered his newspaper and just went, I know, don't get married. And then continued reading, which is very, it's very unnerving. I think it's amazing that your mom was there to experience this as well, that your mom was there to actually witness this because she can verify that it happened and that this woman, whoever she was, whether it was your aunt or whether it was you, you, you've grown to look like this woman. I just think this story is wild. And I hope that if you ever do get married, that it doesn't go tits up. That'd be great. And story number three comes from Jamie. This happened over the summer of 2023. I was living with my grandmother for that summer with my aunt to help out with my uncle, my grandfather and the house. One thing you must understand, my grandmother will go anywhere to get something that she found on Facebook Marketplace. This trip, it was me and her driving 40 minutes away to the town over. As we were passing a lone bridge in broad daylight, I saw something in the rafters of the bridge. Not on the road below or above the bridge, but in the rafters below the road on top of the bridge. It was the weirdest thing. Firstly, its skin was like that of red clay. I don't mean he was dirty, I mean his skin looked like the red clay that you would find in the southwest of the USA in New Mexico or Arizona. That is not how melanin works. And it just stared at me while I was the passenger of my grandmother's car. When we got closer, I saw he, she, it wasn't wearing clothes and it pushed itself back up into the rafters with one hand. I still think about it. Maybe I was stressed, maybe it was a strong homeless man who had the rarest skin condition in the world, maybe it was mental illness. My family is known for it, even I have signs, but mine is flitting shadows in the corner of my eye. The only thing that tells me that it could have been something else was when I turned to my grandmother, she seemed visibly frightened. She refuses to discuss it with me to this day. I feel like when the adults in your life, like your parents 
or your grandparents, when they refuse to discuss something, that's when you know some weird stuff has gone down. If this podcast has taught us anything, it's that if somebody in your life refuses to discuss what they have seen, then you have seen something really weird. I had a cursory Google of like cryptids with red skin and I couldn't find anything specific. However, that does not mean that what you saw wasn't paranormal. Also, if what you saw wasn't paranormal, it's still absolutely terrifying. I don't believe that you were hallucinating or it was symptomatic of of mental illness considering both you and your grandmother saw it. If it was just you who had seen it, then maybe. But even if it was a homeless person who, you know, was, was really strong and able to haul themselves back up into the rafters of a bridge and for some reason had really red skin, that is still a terrifying thing to witness. I really would love to know what this was. Like, are we talking skinwalker territory here? I mean, I don't know. I don't want to be throwing that around flippantly, but that's the only thing I can think of that would fit that sort of description. And story number four comes from Shika. Currently, I am a PhD student and my experience dates somewhere in September of 2018. Back then, I was in my final year of my master's. It was quite a nerve-wracking month because of exams. I used to study all night and generally sleep during the daytime after the exam. One night at around 3am, I was studying, as usual, sitting on the couch. I then checked the time on my phone and it was 3.03am. I jokingly put a story on my Snapchat captioning it as 3.03 a.m. devil's hour with a haha emoji and an all black background. One of my college friends was awake at the time and saw my story. He replied to it asking me what stupidity I was doing by posting such stories at this late at night and suggesting that I should just sleep as it was our exam in the morning at 8 a.m. I chatted with him for a bit and then kept the books aside, turning the lights off and fell asleep. My brother was also asleep on the other side of the couch, as he was also studying for his exam. We were both sound asleep. Suddenly I felt like I had sleep paralysis. I opened my eyes and could see an all-black, huge, seven to eight foot tall shadow floating towards me from the other side of the room. I froze. I was unable to move my body as I lay there watching that strange silhouette approaching me. I was dead scared. I tried so hard to literally say anything just to wake up my brother, who was on the other side of the couch. No words came out of my mouth, no matter how hard I tried. I even was struggling with my hands to somehow move them and nudge my brother. I simply couldn't do anything. It felt like a lifetime laying there and staring at that figure slowly moving towards me. It then sat on my chest and I started to choke on my breath. I couldn't see anything just a black figure staring into my soul, and it felt like all the life out of me was being sucked. I closed my eyes and started reciting Hanuman Chalisa, which is basically a Hindu prayer for Lord Hanuman, who is known to ward off evil and protect us. To my surprise, I forgot all the verses of the prayer as if I never knew what Hanuman Chalisa was. Although I have known the prayer since I was five years of age, But at that particular moment, I couldn't remember a single word of Hanuman Chalisa. After so many attempts of trying to remember, I finally got the words out and started chanting it over and over again, keeping my eyes closed until I finally fell asleep. Some time had passed and I had a dream which felt so real. The dream started with me telling my parents about this weird encounter that I had. My father was reading the newspaper and my mother was cutting the vegetables for breakfast. I kept going with telling them about my encounter with that unknown entity. My father did not respond a bit, so I pulled the newspaper down from his face and saw him dead with a heart attack. I screamed that Papa is not responding, he is dead, he is dead. Hearing this, my mother also had a heart attack and they both died. I suddenly woke up sweating and panting. The first thought in my mind was to delete that horrific story I posted on my Snapchat mocking the devil. It was like my mind was telling me to just delete it or else something bad might happen to both of my parents. I hastily opened my Snapchat and to my utter shock the story wasn't there. 
I do remember posting it at exactly 3.03am and I do remember my conversation with my friend about it after that, but there was nothing, no story. I then checked the chats that I had with my friend and it was there, but the story wasn't. I couldn't comprehend what had just happened. Was it a warning from the devil not to mess with these things? Was it a dream? I don't know what exactly that was. And to this day, I can't really understand what happened that night. One more thing. It was 4.30 in the morning when I checked my phone in order to delete that story. Which meant that whatever encounter I had, and the following dream about my parents' demise, all happened within a one and a half hour time span. It was really, really scary. I also inquired with my friend about our chats and my story to confirm whether I was crazy or it really did happen. He casually told me that we did chat that night about the story, so it meant that it was real. I then told him everything that happened after. I don't know how to describe this, but I act as a magnet to paranormal stuff ever since I was a child. I see things... I feel things and sometimes have visions about things that are about to happen in the future. I've been an extremely spiritual person since I was four or five years of age. I am a Hindu and practice puja or worship on an almost daily basis. I always knew seeing or feeling these things was not normal. Recently, in December 2023, I consulted a well-known astrologer about my life's guidance I told him about my experiences with energies and how it affects me. He validated me in a very comforting manner, that I am a walking portal and that is why such things are attracted to me. He also made quite shocking revelations that I have immense power to open portals anywhere and can manifest anything. He warned me to stay put on my prayers and good energies because I have no control on these powers that he described as my abilities. I was also advised to practice meditation on a regular basis so that I can gain some control on my mental abilities to open portals. Now some people might be sceptical to this experience, but I know for a fact that just like a battery has both positive and negative charge to produce current and electricity, in a similar manner there is good and there definitely is evil too. Oh I remember the days of pulling all-nighters for exams. Oh, even the thought of that gives me anxiety. To be really honest, if I were you and I was in that same situation, I'd probably be like, it was the Snapchat, that's what did it. Especially if I had sleep paralysis and that dream in the space of like an hour and a half, I'd be going, right, well, that's that's freaky enough for me to delete that Snapchat story. However, in saying that, I do genuinely think that the devil, if he exists, if it exists, I don't know. I mean, surely it has better things to be doing than scourging people who are doing exams and making very, I would say, a very tame joke on Snapchat about the devil's hour. You know, if I were him, I'd be busy, I don't know, whispering in the ears of politicians or whatever else it is that the devil's meant to do. Normally, being a little extra can be a bit much. But when it comes to healthcare, it pays to be extra. And United Healthcare makes it easy with Health Protector Guard fixed indemnity insurance plans. Underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, they supplement your primary plan, helping you manage out of pocket costs without the usual requirements and restrictions like deductibles and enrollment periods. So when it comes to covering your medical bills, you can feel good about being a little extra. Visit uh1.com to find the Health Protector Guard plan for you. Hey everyone, I'm Craig Robinson, co-host of the Ways to Win podcast, alongside my good friend John Calipari. I've been on the go recently, Phoenix, Kansas City, Chicago. If you're like me and have a home but aren't always at home, you have an Airbnb. Hosting your home or a spare room is a very practical side hustle. If you live in a big game town, you can Airbnb your place for fans to stay in. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash post. And story number five comes from Molly. My mother has been very interactive with ghosts since she was a young girl. Or more that ghosts were very interested in her. She doesn't know that I am writing in her part in this, so I will keep it vague for her. 
She had a spirit of someone close to her in life that followed her throughout her teens and who would sit on her bed, appear in visions and even take tapes out of her player because she didn't approve of her music. They were always left on the side of the player wound back as well. This lady spirit watched over her for many years but when my mum got married to my dad she never saw her again as if she was happy that my dad was now there to look after her in her place. My mum also talked about my first family home, that the kettle would turn on randomly and that the cupboard doors would open and close at random. She told me once that her and my father were downstairs watching TV one night when me and my brother had gone to bed and heard someone coming down the stairs. Thinking it was me or my brother, they called out and asked what was wrong to only be met with silence. They went upstairs to find me and my brother fast asleep. There are lots more stories of her, such as having visions of her mother breaking down and then finding she had actually broken down. But as I said, I wanted to keep it vague. Since being a little girl, I have had many strange things happen to me that I see as being paranormal. I believe strongly that my mum's connection with the spirits has passed down to me, yet she never invited them or tried to connect. I, however, have researched and welcomed spirits to me as much as I would welcome a friend and consider myself a spiritual person. I have always believed in spirits and the paranormal and have never doubted that I attract spirits to myself, even though I have no idea why they seem to like me. My dad, however, has been a hardcore sceptic all his life. For context, you must know my grandparents lived in a very old farm cottage dating back hundreds of years. My mum recalls me being excited about going to my grandparents to have sleepovers because I could play with the little girl, Melody. My mum brushed this off as me having an imaginary friend as I was still very young at the time, maybe five or six years old. One time while visiting, my parents stayed the night also. My mum was woken up by my dad, sat upright in bed, hunched over and his hands clasped together. She asked him what he was doing and he responded, Shush, I'm praying. My mum looked around the room and saw nothing and then asked him again what he was doing and once again he said, Shush, I'm praying to the little girl. My mum, seeing no one, brushed it off as him sleep-talking and went back to sleep. The next morning she asked him about what he was doing last night. Then he said, straight-faced, bearing in mind my dad's scepticism, I was praying. There was a girl beside the bed asking me to pray. My mum then asked him to describe her and he did. On the way home, my mother asked me to describe what the girl Melody looked like. I told her she wore a weird school uniform, which was navy blue. She had plaited long hair and wore a funny hat, a bonnet. I had described the exact girl my dad had seen without me knowing what he saw. I have faded memories of seeing this girl Melody behind the window in the spare room, the window connecting the room to my grandparents' dressing room. She would draw the curtains on the dressing room side and smile at me. I also remember her sitting on the bed, and the bed went down as if someone was actually sitting on it. Even today I never feel alone in the house when visiting, as if I'm always being watched, though it never feels threatening. Now being older I describe her as having an old style uniform on, with a right rectangular bib around her front and shoulders, piped with a navy trim around it. She wore a white shirt and a blue cardigan with a pleated skirt and bonnet. Though many years down the line my memory of her isn't as good, I will always remember her this way and can still see her peeking through the window. It was never threatening. She felt like a very lonely spirit. My grandparents never mentioned seeing her, so I think maybe having a girl her age that could see her brought her some joy. And though I haven't seen her since, like I mentioned... I still feel her when I visit. My second experience happened on a school trip. I must have been no more than 10 years old, if not younger. We were visiting a manor house, which had a huge cellar running under it. On the trip, the tour people told us that they play hide and seek in the dark in the cellars, which, looking back on it now, would be a massive health and safety violation, but things were different back then. Anyway, they started counting and we all excitedly ran around these huge cellar corridors trying to hide ourselves. I have really strong memories of hiding in this nook behind a corner, 
and I remember being super excited I had found such a good place to hide. Once the tour guide had counted down, the lights went off. I sat in the dark, squatted into this small space, listening out for any sign of being caught. I could hear them far away but still remained crouched and hidden as I heard them find other kids and them shouting as they got found. I then distinctly remember hearing some footsteps coming down the corridor that I was hiding in and I held my breath and waited in the pitch black as the footsteps got closer. They then stopped, what sounded like just before the sharp corner. I waited and listened intently before I felt two hands grab the sides of my jacket and around my ribs, sending me from my crouched position to landing flat on my arse. I shouted out, but there was no one there. The feeling of someone present left me. I remember feeling terrified. Even 14 years later, I can still remember that fear. I ran down the corridors until I bumped into one of the teachers, and I had never felt so relieved. I never told anyone as a kid and only talked about it much later once all the events I will talk about started happening regularly. I also learned many years later that a British programme called Most Haunted had visited said manor and dove into the cellars. And yes, they were very haunted. My parents decided a few years later to move house and they found a house they were really happy with and decided to bring me and my brother to see it. I was about 12 or 13 at that point, so I remember this a lot more clearly. I walked into the house and it was like being hit with smoke. This really heavy feeling hit me. This sadness and anger filled my body and I just thought, I did not want to be in this house. I didn't feel welcome at all. Once we viewed the house, I told my mum what I felt and she brushed it off as what I suppose would be teen angst and that I just didn't want to move house. A week or so later, she was caught by one of the potential neighbours, who told her she was surprised she was buying the house. My mum asked why, and she told her the reason it was up for sale was that the man who owned it last had killed himself in it, which was that negative energy that I was feeling. Safe to say I was taken to every house viewing after that. Fast forward a little bit and we had found a very non-haunted house to live in. My parents, not long after that, had gotten divorced, so it was just myself, my mum and my brother. I started to attend a high school that all the older kids called haunted. I had a lot of experiences here. I remember constantly being on edge whenever I was alone in the school. I would see brief faces in the windows of the main building and I never felt alone. Walking through the main hall, I was leaving my French class to go to the main building toilet. While very quickly crossing the assembly hall, I felt I was not alone. I quickened my pace, and as soon as I did, I heard a very loud man's voice. Hey! Right next to my ear. Safe to say, I sprinted out of the hall after that. Another time, I was in the main girl's toilet in the main building, and once I'd finished, I washed my hands. I looked down the row of toilets to see a bulky black mist at the end of the toilet row. I remember being freaked out and only looked at it for a second before bolting. The last encounter I had there was because I never went back into these toilets afterwards from pure fear. Again, I was washing my hands, and as I looked up in the mirror, I was shoved into the lip of the sink. Not tapped, not pushed, but shoved, as if being ran into at full force. I was the only one in there. I continued at this school for another four years and I never once stepped foot in there again. Later, looking up the history of the school, I found out it was originally a hospital and the girls' main building toilets, yep, you guessed it, was the morgue. After leaving school, all the paranormal activity died for years and I thought, well, now I'm older, it surely faded with age. I was wrong. This was merely a resting part of my life. For context, I was mentally unwell during these years and was battling with an eating disorder. I don't know if that had anything to do with the pause, but after I recovered, it started up again, leading me to believe that they may not have been drawing my energy because I was so weak that I had none to give. When I left college, I went straight into work at 18. 
At this point, I started getting more into gothic culture and metal bands and, of course, the macabre. With that, I started looking into tarot cards and readings, and that's where it started up again, as if opening myself back up to the other world. I was seeing this guy at the time, Ken. Ken and I eventually moved out together into this old, semi-detached cottage. The vibe had nothing paranormal to it and seemed pretty dead spiritually. Or so I thought. One date night I decided to go to this museum that was displaying two female skulls that you could hold. Me being the creepy goth I was, I was so excited to hold these skulls. The woman told us that people had experiences with the skulls, but didn't want to tell us as not to contaminate what we felt. I jokingly made fun of the skull's appearance, and let me tell you, a very big lesson was learned that day of don't make fun of the dead ever. I was filled with emptiness and sadness when I held her and I started to feel weird. My hands went numb. I handed the skull back and told the woman my hands were numb and she said, yeah, that's one of the things that have been known to happen. She also said the feeling of happiness was associated with her, but I felt so sad and empty. I told her this and she assured me it would go away, but it didn't. We went around the rest of the museum, but I wasn't interested. My hands were numb and I felt awful. I got Ken to bite my hand hard to show him that I wasn't lying and that I couldn't feel a thing in them. It was about an hour before I regained feeling in them. That night I could not sleep. I felt dread every time I felt like drifting off. The next night, the same, and also the one after that. Finally, on the third night, I fell asleep, and I remember waking up halfway through the night to see a shadow figure squatting next to my bed. Their eyes were glowing white, and then I fell back asleep. Apparently, Ken did not sleep much that night. I have no memory of doing this, but apparently I sat up and stared at the spot next to our bed, and when he asked me what I was doing, I looked at him, with massive wide eyes and I said the eyes he asked again what I meant and I repeated myself before collapsing and falling back to sleep we joke about this now but he insists he has never been so scared in his life this then became a common thing I would sit bolt upright without warning and either stare openly at something with massively wide eyes or I would say some creepy shit before going back to sleep A year later I returned to the same place and held the same skull, only to have the exact thing happen. Numb hands and no sleep for three days. So clearly she has still not forgiven me. This next chapter in my life is called Mysterious Shadow Creatures and Where to Find Them. All day and night I would see shadows of people varying in size everywhere. When I looked around they were never there or they would scamper away. There was a very cheeky one at the factory I worked at which had the very creative name of Work Ghost. I would always see him and following a sighting my pens would go missing or my rulers would randomly stand on end and flop back and forth which I do have a video of. Work Ghost still works with me to this day and I got to say I would be sad to be without him. He loves to knock on the walls or doors to let me know that he is there. And when he does, I will always say, good morning, sir, or good afternoon, sir, I haven't heard from you today. My co-workers think I'm mad. From this point, shadows became a very big part of my life and still are today. My current partner has to get used to me whipping my head around to stare at nothing or me saying hello to no one there. He also had to get used to the waking up in the middle of the night to a weird, creepy person that you should drop kick down a long set of stairs. Ken and I split as we saw each other more as friends and we still are now. This next part isn't paranormal but it's very spiritual and spooky. I find it so interesting with what happened and I hope you do too. My tarot cards were telling me that I needed time alone after Ken and that I had to work on myself. So I worked two jobs to earn a bit more money so I could buy my own house. I was working in a cafe at the time and a lady came in for coffee. We were chatting and I mentioned that I was looking for more hours and she mentioned she ran a pub down the road and was looking for help. So with that I had an evening job. One night working my manager asked me, Hey Moll, you're single aren't you? 
I said yes, but I'm not looking for anything right now. He then proceeded to go on about his mate and how they thought we would be a good match, and he was very promptly denied. He mentioned this mate almost every shift that we worked together. After one shift, I did my usual reading, but it was different to normal. I drew the first card of the King of Swords. Looking up the card, it is associated with a calm male who is closely affiliated with Geminis. It told me I needed to open up as someone was entering my path. Thinking I got a weird feeling, I reshuffled the cards and the first card I picked off the top was the King of Swords. I laughed and shuffled again for a good five minutes. This time, I got a feeling that I should pick from the middle to be really sure I wasn't going to get the same card. As I was shuffling, I heard an owl. I was shocked because at this point I had been living in this house for three years and I had never heard an owl once. And we also lived in the centre of a busy town, so how the hell was there an owl? I went to pick a card out from the middle and I pulled out the King of Swords. I was suitably freaked and cleansed the area before putting them away, lulled to sleep by the owl. My next shift, my manager asked about his friend, and this time I said yes. We met up at a pub, and he wasn't my usual type. He had long blonde hair, very handsome, tall and slender. He was a typical indie surfer type from the south coast. Meanwhile, I was a green-haired goth, plump and short, complete polar opposites in everything. I always get very nervous on dates with people I don't know, but when I saw him it was like my body went, Oh, there you are. I've been looking for you. Total cliché, but I cannot lie. I very much liked Indie Boy from the start. A few hours into the date, I built up enough courage to ask him what his star sign was. Gold star to whoever guessed that he was a Gemini. After a few more dates, I was invited back to his place. He led me into the lounge where, on the wall, hung a big painting of an owl, just like the ones I heard during my reading. At that point, I was staring in shock. He asked what was up and I gave him the speech that I'm sure all spiritual people give new partners. Hey, I'm not like other girls, I see dead people. I explained that a lot of things will happen if we took this further and he would inevitably be a part of it as Ken had been. He told me a few months in that he thought I was lying and that I was just doing it to be extra alternative and creepy, but he soon found out that it was no joke. I follow the deity Hecate and do a lot of work with her to help me through life. She is associated with triple threes and not a day goes by where I don't see them. Funnily enough, owls and birds are associated with my other deity, Athena. He told me the most defining moment of belief for him was when we had an argument and he went out to get some headspace on his motorbike. When riding, he got fouled on by a bird while going over a crossroad. He pulled over to the closest lay-by where he cleaned himself up and once he could see, he looked up to see a car with the number plate 333. My girl's telling him off, I suppose. Another defining moment for him was while visiting family down south. We were walking past a bench of memorial and I read the man's name aloud. Once I did, I saw this tall, dark figure in the shrubbery next to us. I went quiet and told my partner just to keep walking and don't say anything. He knew then that I was seeing something. We kept walking and just as the figure would get out of sight, he would reappear further up the pathway. It followed us for a good five minutes before staying in his final spot as if he could go no further. I then told my partner what had happened and he saw how shaken I was and my energy had depleted substantially. I thought that I would end it here as I feel like I'm writing a book at this point. There are loads more things that I could write about such as working in a heavily haunted cafe and making good friends with the main spirit there or the spirit that taps on our upstairs window most nights and opens our wardrobe doors. I could talk all day about the little spookies that bless my life and keep me awake at night. Though scary, I do feel blessed with this experience and I'm sure there are many more to come as I grow on my spiritual journey. I may send another email later down the line of my newest adventures. I do truly believe my partner was chosen for me by my guides and spirits, 
and I have been gifted someone who is so understanding of my connection to what he calls dem spooky boys. So I will continue making connections and listening to your podcasts and giving any orangutan stuffy the side eye. Thank you for many hours of comfort that I am not alone on this journey. Molly, babes, you are definitely not alone on this journey. And I left that bit in at the end because I think that's one of the important things to take away from the podcast is that actually people like knowing that there are other people who experience weird and spooky shit. It makes them feel less weird and less of an outsider. So if you do ever feel like, oh, I shouldn't send my story in, there's no point, it's not scary enough, etc, etc. Don't drop, drop kick those, those fears, drop kick those naysaying thoughts and get that story written in. And we love a hardcore sceptic dad on this podcast. There is always a hardcore sceptic dad on the podcast. And generally, hardcore sceptic dad gets his comeuppance. He must have gotten some shock when he described that girl and you later, with no knowledge of what had happened, described the same girl, this little imaginary friend that you had always been playing with. And you, Molly, were a spooky kid. And you would have been booted down those stairs into oblivion if you were living in my world. And I do love that on this school trip, the the tour guides were like, hey, everybody, let's play hide and seek in the dark with all of these, this big group of children. You're totally right. I mean, nowadays, that would absolutely not fly. That would absolutely not be allowed health and safety wise. But you know what? All those years ago, absolutely fine. Do what you want. Run around in the dark, get injured run around in the dark and hide, it's fine. As long as we end up with roughly the same amount of children at the end of the tour, it's fine. But the physicality of these experiences are the things that really sound horrendous to me. Like whatever this was, grabbing the sides of your jacket around your ribs and sending you flying and then whatever it was later in the school toilets that pushed you against the sink. Like that is so physical. That's not just seeing things out of the corner of your eye or you know, feeling a presence. Not that those things should be dismissed either. They're still terrifying. But having something physically put its hands on you really, really scares the shit out of me. And it's so interesting that you talk about that museum that was displaying those human skulls. I mean, I would have gone to see them as well. I love anything to do with the anatomy and I'm very fascinated by it. But I um, I went to a witchcraft museum. Mm, maybe... But Bose Ca- in Bos Castle, Bose Castle, on the south, um, on the south west coast of England, went to the witchcraft museum. was really cool, and they had a room full of dolls and puppets, and um, they have people who regularly feel really sick, get really strange feelings in that room. I don't know, like I feel like these items that have importance to the person that owned them they do seem to have some sort of power and there's nothing more important I think to own than your own skull and you know what (laughs) poor Ken that's all I'll say because I would be absolutely traumatized with if somebody that I was sleeping in a bed with like sat up wide-eyed staring at me staring at something that I can't see in the room being like the eyes the eyes I would be absolutely traumatized for real but I guess a good way to deal with it you know like you have in your workplace is to just be like I'm acknowledging this I'm gonna be polite I'm not gonna be rude and that's okay and I love that you found your match I really do and I love that the cards gave you that little impetus to go ahead and meet this person because I think if somebody had said to you it sounds like if somebody had said to you on paper this is what this guy looks like and this is what this guy is into you'd be like oh that's that doesn't sound like my type and he probably wouldn't have gone for it but the cards being like poke poke little prod for you to go for it here you are how sweet I love it Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Thank you to Russell, Anonymous, Jamie, Sheikha and Molly for sending in your stories. Remember the last story came from January the 30th, 2024. And if you would like to send in your story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast.gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories where for five dollars a month or two dollars a month you get access to heaps of extra content as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free 
And on that note, I shall see you next time. Even when we're on a budget, we still deserve nice things. Quince is a place to scoop up stunning high-end goods for 50 to 80% less than similar brands. They have buttery soft cashmere sweater starting at $50, luxurious Italian leather bags, and so much more. Plus, Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing. Get the high-end goods you'll love without the high price tag with Quince. Go to quince.com slash style for free shipping and 365-day returns.